Lecture 35. Now, if you'll take your three versions of the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll put it out in front of us, and let me tell you a couple of exciting things about it. I need first of all to say, however, that、um, it's surprising in Third Nephi how much of that material was given just to the twelve apostles. Now they were apostles. Don't anyone miss that? They're called disciples in the Book of Mormon, but they all had the apostolic calling, but were under the keys of the apostles in Jerusalem. That's the way the Lord does things, and He later clarifies that they. Will judge the Nephites and Lamanites, but they, in turn,、uh, the disciples will be judged by the ones who hold the keys in Jerusalem. So there's only one set of keys on the earth at one time. But in this case, we had twelve apostles in Jerusalem and a quorum of twelve over here. The keys being in Jerusalem. Everybody understand that principle? You could almost look upon these as assistants to the twelve, but they had full. Apostolic status, just like Paul did. Paul was never a member of the Quorum of Twelve in Jerusalem. He was an apostle, and so was Barnabas. But they were not members of the Quorum. At the present time, Alvin、uh, Dyer is a a full apostle, but not a member of the Quorum. Everyone understand that? The Quorum actually is a governing body, but you could have many apostles who have that calling. Now, as soon as Jesus had selected the twelve, he did something real interesting. He、um, he said to the twelve, "I want to remind you now of something you've been discussing that has created confusion, and I want to give it to you now so that it will be recorded and never changed. When you have a person who has really repented and wants to make his commitment to me, I want you to take them down in the water." He didn't say raise the hand to the square, but that is the priesthood position. And I want you to this, then say, having having authority given me of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Three words are changed in the twentieth section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Mean exactly the same thing. Today we say having. Been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He said, "I want this baptism in the name of all three, because this ordinance is in the name of the whole Godhead, not just the Son, not just the Father, not just the Holy Ghost, the entire Godhead, which is one." Now he said, "Bring them back up out of the water." They then received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and this. Is the gospel? This is my doctrine: that people can repent, they can change their past, and if they will come to me, I can blot out their past, and they can be born again. That is the gospel. If anybody wants you to tell them what the gospel is, you tell them: it is believing on Jesus Christ, repenting of our offenses, making our commitment to God. And receiving the refreshing, refining spirit of the Holy Ghost—that is the fullness of the gospel. Now, the Book of Mormon is just loaded with a lot of information to implement number one: your faith. Your faith in God and Christ increases with understanding and with evidence. And so, when it says the fullness of the gospel is in the Book of Mormon, it not only means that the basic principles are taught there. But as Joseph Smith said, you can get closer to God and feel a more magnificent outpouring of the Spirit by reading that book than any other one. So we're in the right book, that the Lord would say. Now, he turned to the multitude after he'd instructed the quorum of the twelve, and he said, "Now these twelve have authority to baptize you. All these people, most of these people have been baptized. That's why they're at this conference." I agree with Brother Sperry. This was a conference of the church called about a about eleven months after the、uh, resurrection of Christ, and it was the first time they'd met at the temple in Bountiful, and、uh, they're all congregated together probably to hear Nephi the third. And lo and behold, this other thing happened right while they were just kind of shaking hands and noticing the changes and talking about Savior. The two things they were discussing. All right,、um, Jesus said. 
they have power and authority to baptize with water, but I confer the Holy Ghost. Now a little later on, he gives them authority to lay on hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why did he say then that he confers the Holy Ghost? Exactly. Did you all hear that? No one has the authority on this side of the veil to confer the Holy Ghost. All that you can do is lay on hands and confirm them members of the church and make them eligible to receive the Holy Ghost. And so you do not say to them, I confer upon you the Holy Ghost. You say, receive the Holy Ghost. That's a commandment. Receive. You don't say receive ye the Holy Ghost because ye means a lot of people. You receive the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Ghost. That means now you've repented. You've made your commitments. The Holy Ghost now wants to minister to you. But it has to be authorized by Christ himself before it can begin to operate. And it will only operate from the other side of the veil. Everybody understand that? So actually you have a period of preparation. Uh, and you'll see the change come in yourself if you watch carefully. People who have sort of been in the gutter when they hear the gospel for the first time and have to make a tremendous upsurge, they, they notice the change more than others. In this very room, I had one of my students uh, five years ago. Uh, he violated all of the commandments consistently with uh, vigor and enthusiasm, except murder. That he had not done. Everything else he had done. And then he got to this university after getting sick and tired of riots at another university, uh, very outstanding athlete and so forth, was converted to the gospel while he was here, made the change, and his friends did not know him. The fact that he would be moral, sober, tell the truth, not steal, unbelievable. It be changed. And, and, the, and he has a sweet spirit with him. Uh, doing graduate work now, I see him every once in a while. Just great. Great. I had one of our, a very attractive, lovely girl in one of my classes about four or five years ago that um, uh, came up and said she wanted to be baptized. I thought she'd been a member. And she said she wanted to be baptized, so I, uh, I asked her what her background. She said, well, it's taken me quite a while to become worthy. Uh, she said, I, I didn't ever think I could become worthy, but I've been interviewed now, and, and I've worked for a year to become worthy, and I think now I want to tell the Lord how much I love him. I want to spend all the rest of my life. I didn't even know anything about the Lord. And she'd been on the line as um, uh, a prostitute since she was 15. And somebody told her about BYU, and she came up here and found out what a terrible life she'd been living. And... and uh, I saw her about, uh, oh, it's been about a year ago now. You just wouldn't know her. And uh, she'd had that ugly life, uh, terribly ugly life, when she told me what had happened to her when she was even tiny and uh, what she'd been subject to. I, it, it almost made you weep to think what a human being can do. They just struggle a little and strive a little and look for the good because her life had really been abused by all the people that had been around her. And she made it and triumphantly married, went to the temple, now has, I think, yeah, one youngster. But it's just, it's thrilling what the gospel can do. And that's what this is all about that we're discussing. Because the gospel finds people where they are. But in any event, you can watch the new birth operating in a person. Uh, you can watch it working in yourself. And that's what could we come next. First, however, I want you to notice that Jesus said, in effect, all of you are glad that you were here. There are 2,500 of you. I know you're glad that you were here. I let every one of you feel the wounds in my side and in my hands and my feet. But I want to say this to you. More blessed than you are they that are not here today and after hearing your testimony will seek out in prayer the witness of the Spirit that when you said you were here and saw me that it's true. I want to ask you now, why more blessed? Which would you choose between? Being there or not being there? Wouldn't that be a hard choice? Not really. Would you choose not to be there? Certainly. Would you? That would be a test for me. That would really be a trial. Um, 
if I knew that he was there and I could go and see him, but I'd, get, I'd be more blessed if I stayed away. Uh, I just wonder if it wasn't worth the price, you know, to, 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 in any event. Why more blessed for those who aren't there? More faith. And remember this principle, will you? More faith reaps more blessings. Just remember that. And that after the tr test and trial of your faith, then cometh the blessings. And we all have a trial of our faith one way or another. Um, and, and out of it all comes tremendous blessings. Don't ever forget that nothing happens to us that our Heavenly Father didn't pretty well know was coming. And uh, it was a trial of our faith, and it comes to us in different ways and different patterns. But there's a great blessing after the trial of our faith. Tremendous blessings. Now, he starts out by describing the spiritual rebirth. And that's at the bottom of page one of your, your triple um, version of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, in the church, we have discovered something that's exciting about the Beatitudes. Frankly, I have to tell you that the first time I read the Beatitudes, they lacked both beauty, which everybody talked about. They sounded uh, um, platitudinous. I didn't have the key to them, you see, so they didn't mean anything, and they don't mean anything to most people. They're the, probably the most quoted, least understood scripture that we've got. These eight principles of beatitude represents the eight steps by which you reach the attainment of perfection in this life. It isn't eight platitudes. Uh, as a matter of fact, it isn't even in stair-step fashion. Some of these things happen simultaneously to you but it is to guide you in achieving that position where you could stand in the presence of your God and say, now, I think I'm strong enough even to endure persecution unto death. Now, I tell you, you've got to go a long ways to reach that, to face the terror of that kind of persecution. So I want you to just notice what this really means because it isn't taught, as far as I know, anywhere else in the world. Here are the keys to the Beatitudes. All of you came to this class today with different problems. Some of you, not very many, but a few of you are just full of life and at this particular moment, everything is under control. He loves you, or vice versa, she loves you. Uh, you've got enough money to stay in school for six more weeks. Uh, you've got your life in, under pretty good control. Uh, uh, your, the prospects of the mission are just up there, whatever else you have planned. Things are just going great for you. And that's what they say an optimist is. He's one that says, cheer up, chum, when everything's going his way. You know. Well, any <coughs> uh, anyway, there are a few of you who came today in that situation. But probably the mo most of you didn't. Most of you came with a certain amount of poverty of spirit. Now, poverty of spirit is overwhelming frustration, it's discouragement, it's a degree of unhappiness because things are getting out of control. And it may be romance, it may be a roommate with whom one is quarreling, it may be parents who do not understand, it may be finances, it may be not having done one's homework, and there are only six weeks to go, an overwhelming feeling. But poverty of spirit is an unhappy state, and Lucifer capitalizes on it. If your poverty of spirit is the result of neglect on your part, he really goes after you to show you how unworthy you are, that your parents may be great, your brothers and sisters were great, your roommates are great, but you are a tramp. And he tells you, you're not worthy, you're not going to make it, you shouldn't have come in the first place. And this, Jesus says, you must overcome. And I have a way to help you overcome it, if you'll just come with me. And so he says, you can be blessed, you who are poor in spirit. <clears throat> it can even be, you can even have the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> excuse me, ultimately, if you will come unto me. Now, that's not in the King James Version. It's an inspired version, and it's the way Jesus taught at the Nephites. You who are discouraged and poor in spirit at this moment because of things you've done in the past you shouldn't have done, or things that are all mixed up, or you're misunderstood, you're accused of things that aren't true, whatever it is, 
you who are poor in spirit who come unto me think what you really have the whole kingdom of heaven so stay with me it's a simple pattern and then he comes over and says if you are afflicted with sorrow and sorrow comes from many things the loss of a loved one is an affliction and a sorrow that will fade somewhat with the passing of time but when uh, you've loved someone very dearly and they've been very close to you your parents your own children a brother and sister takes a while in any event there's another kind of mourning that is more depressing because it's you for whom you're mourning and when you look back and see how you've really destroyed your life like this girl she sat in our classes I didn't know she was out there I had no idea what she was uh, struggling with as she thought of her own personal life and how profligate it had been and how some of one of next to the very worst offense she had committed uh, numerous times I didn't know that that she was in mourning and she was in mourning for a year and the Savior says you can be blessed so that you can be comforted and all your mourning removed the mourning will go if you'll just come with me now that which you have done can be blotted out I can do it I can change your past and I can make it so that you won't even feel that it happened to you it will be an ugly part of your life that won't even seem ugly won't even be part of you anymore I can do it and then you'll be comforted and then he says for me to be able to do to, to do that I must have you come meekly with a broken heart a contrite spirit and say whatever is required my Savior I will do whatever is required and he said all right if you will then humbly come into the waters of baptism and make your commitment and set your goals now and manifest to my father by going down in the water that you are bearing your past and coming into the resurrection of a new life then I will have the Spirit of God begin to work and abide in you until you will know you are forgiven that's his request having done that he then says now will you go on to hunger and thirst after righteousness will you start studying the gospel will you start understanding it will you attend your meetings will you pay your tithes will you start being helpful to other people and look out around you and stop being so self-centered about your own sins and your own weaknesses and start becoming meaning something to other people will you seek after righteousness if you do I can fill you with the Holy Ghost and that's what you want because until the Holy Ghost fills you you won't know for sure that you're forgiven and when that spirit of peace comes over you it will be the Holy Ghost ministering unto you now, I want to say just something about the ministry of the Holy Ghost because unless you know what to look for you won't know when it's ministering to you nor will you give credit to God for the dispensation you've just received you must become accustomed to having received the Holy Ghost getting down immediately upon your knees and saying my Heavenly Father thank you for that now here's what will happen let me put it the way the Book of Mormon puts it it says in 3rd Nephi that the Holy Ghost will come upon you and you'll be baptized with fire and like the Lamanites won't know it did you notice that passage the Lamanites were baptized with fire and knew it not now what does that mean here is one of the great lessons to learn about the ministry of the Holy Ghost in your personality and being there were some Lamanites or Zoramites that really knew they were baptized with fire they were there with Nephi and Lehi and they, they really knew that that they were baptized with fire the fire was all around them they had a Pentecostal experience but when they went out to bear their testimony the rest of the Lamanites the Lamanites didn't get any fire guess what they got all of a sudden you know all of a, I don't hate Nephites anymore can you believe it I don't hate Nephites anymore uh, by the way I, <clears throat> I don't think I've told my wife for a long time that I loved her I gotta get my children around me and teach them the gospel and by the way let's give back all the land of the Nephites we shouldn't have taken it from them anyway that was cheating and stealing give it back to them now that's what happens to a person with the Holy Ghost and it will really change your personality and if you seek you hunger and thirst after righteousness 
and you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you will change as much as that athlete I was telling you about or that beautiful young girl who'd had a background no one have, would have suspected. And people uh, who, knew, who knew them when said, it's a new person, just a different person. Now that's what that's talking about. Now here's what Joseph Smith said to watch for. He said, in a pure Ephraimite, and one who was very close to the Lord in the pre-existence, the dispensation of the Holy Ghost on him is not visible. And only he knows when it's resting upon him. And he knows that tremendous things are happening to his mind. And all of a sudden he gets great flashes of knowledge and insight and he says, why well, didn't notice that before? Isn't that wonderful? Now I'm glad I know that. That's beautiful. If he's not careful, he will say, what a brain I have. No, this was the Holy Ghost illuminating his brain. So Joseph Smith says, when you feel pure intelligence pouring into you, accept it for what it is. You are being tuned in on the channel directly with the Father through the ministry of the Holy Ghost. Whatever you are told, write it quickly, because it will fade. Now in the books that you've been reading, I get as much enjoyment out of some of those things that are in there as you do, because they're not mine. And when they came to me, and I got the insight for them, I wrote them fast, because now I go back and I read it and, and I've, it's not mine. And when I read it, I say, isn't that exciting? That's just tremendous to know that. And if I hadn't have written it when it was given to me, I couldn't have given it to you now. Because it isn't mine. Now that's the way the Holy Ghost will minister to you. And when you get a tremendous insight like that, go down on your knees and say, Heavenly Father, thank you. That's what I needed. I've been working on this. I mean, one of the insights there um, came at the end of seven years. I want to tell you, I was on my knees. And when that thing co comes to you with such power, uh, you don't need to be embarrassed about weeping. That's how powerful it is. You will weep. And then when you stand up, you, you, you'll say, what a blessing to be part of this great ministry that God has in these latter days. So learn how to watch for the ministry of the Holy Ghost in your life. One of our students in the other class came up the other day and she says, Brother Skousen, it happened to me Sunday. I'm reading, all of a sudden I was on fire. I couldn't keep back the tears. This Book of Mormon is so magnificent. I can't read it and, and keep back the tears anymore. The Spirit just burns in me. Fine. I said, uh, what have you been doing lately? Oh, should I've never worked so hard in school in the church in my life. That's hungering and thirsting after righteousness, you see. These blessings come. And you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. So recognize it when it comes, thank your Heavenly Father, and record what insights you get. Now here's another thing I must caution you about. Sometimes the Holy Ghost can only lead you a little bit at a time. And it will lead you toward the ultimate truth. Toward it. And you'll feel so good about it, and then when you try to record it, it's dark. You just don't feel like you've got it all yet. So if it, if it, isn't, if it doesn't come in power, don't record it. That once in a while has happened. I didn't get the whole picture. But it shifted me over so far in a different direction, one I'd never even thought about, and there was such a glorious spirit with it, up to the time of recording. And then I didn't have it all. So I thought, oh, all right, I'm at least moving in the right direction. So then I keep studying, keep looking, keep looking, and then finally have another such experience, and finally would it open up so that when you recorded it, you felt so good about it. That's the story. That's the lost doctrine lost to you until you knew it, you see. Now, uh, the next one was, it will change your personality in that you'll become sensitive to other people. You begin to have compassion. Blessed are they who are merciful. Now that's what the, w the word really should be, compassionate, understanding, sensitive, loving of other people. And those are the kind of people you like to be around, people that are like that. None of us are that way all the time. But we're always that way when we have the Spirit of the Lord with us. Have you ever noticed that? Spirit of the Lord is with you. You just love everybody. Uh, even people that uh, get on your nerves. You have some people that get on your nerves, don't you? Uh, and it's not their fault at all. It's just that uh, you, well, they get on your nerves. You can't even explain it to yourself. You know? um, yes. Um, I just got to be more patient with him or her, as the case may be. Uh, I had one professor that... Uh, real high squeaky voice so help me and, and uh, he, he went uh, uh, dignifiedly bald and then he let his hair grow on one side and he'd comb it clear over to the other to cover it up 
And that, that shouldn't have bothered me. I mean, that's his prerogative. He was a little embarrassed about the bald spot. He shouldn't have been. It's just dignity showing through. And, <laughs> <clears throat> but in any event, there were just little things. I sat there in law school, and I went, I've got to analyze why this, this person is very difficult for me to both listen to, to respect, and to admire. And I thought, now, as, a, as an elder in Israel, I've got to do something about this. So guess what I did? I got acquainted with him. He was a great spirit. He was great. That's, that's part of the problem. In any event, you become compassionate, merciful, interested in other people. Now, on one of my world tours, we go through a certain section where I have to warn the people who are with me that the culture that they are now about to pass through has no compassion for children, and they must not be shocked if, if they see some things that are disturbing to them. I just want you to show you how this goes. These people are very gracious. They, they welcome you. They... Uh, they will do things that people in other countries often don't do to make your stay pleasant. Uh, they have made graciousness an art, you see. But if a little child comes up and interrupts them or makes, them, makes a noise, they will hit them across the face with the back of the hand so hard, I've seen them knock almost across the room, and their nose is bleeding, and the little child just screaming with pain, and then they'll turn around and come back and say, excuse me for the interruption. On one bus one time, a little child came up and was kind of begging at the, at the bus. And a man came along on a bicycle, got off the bicycle, grabbed that child, and just pummeled it, just beat on it. And of course, the little child is screaming because uh, uh, almost like it's being killed. I had a hard time keeping them on that bus, on the bus. And then the little child escaped and ran off screaming by itself. And, and uh, he was trying to tell the child, don't, uh, don't beg. The Spirit of the Lord will not have you do it that way. It will have you reprimand, but it will have you do it like it says in the Doctrine and Covenants. Sometimes it even has to be with a certain degree of harshness, but it's always accompanied afterwards with compassion. Uh, so that's something that goes along with the person who is maturing in the Gospel. Now, compassion and merciful, uh, they shall obtain mercy. And, and it is true, a person who's like this gets it back from other people. I've watched it, it works in people. And then you'll notice yourself becoming pure in heart. And that means to say to yourself, I'm not going to do that. It'd be lying. Why would I want to tell him that? That's lying. I did that last year. I don't feel comfortable doing that this year. That's becoming pure in heart. Or you say, now, I'm going to sell this used car. Now, how do I get it unloaded before somebody finds out about the transmission? Maybe I ought to put some sawdust in there or something mixed in with the grease. That clankety thing. Or you say, uh, um... This thing is only worth about twenty-five dollars, but if I, if I, uh, if I tell him thus and so and make up this big story, he might think it's worth a hundred dollars. So I say I want to practice now, so I can sure be sure and give him that line. See, that's not pure in heart, is it? Then there are those who um, exploit uh, their dates, and uh, either way, exploit their dates. It isn't love; it's lust and impurity of heart that is in that date. Um, so, a pure heart is one that likes to do things for other people, does not connive, does not cheat, does not figure out how to put something over on somebody, that actually wears their heart on their sleeve and doesn't worry about it. These are the pure in heart. And you'll find that as the Holy Ghost comes to you, you'll see it in yourself and other people will comment on it. That he's really a good guy. He wouldn't, do a, he wouldn't harm a fly. You've heard that, haven't you? That's the kind of a spirit that will come into you. Now, most Ephraimites are very subtle. So are the tribe of Judah. They're capable of some real shenanigans. I mean, they can really plot it up and gear that thing up so high and get it structured where they, they, they make good con men. And when you let the Holy Ghost work in you, you will not use those talents for evil. You will use them to be persuasive in service and love and building the kingdom. And then you come to the capacity to be a peacemaker. There is a spirit that goes out even in the kingdom, which is one of dissension. It divides priesthood classes. It divides relief societies. It divides classes here at the university. These are those who have a spirit of dissension. The word devil means accuser. And there are, these are they who are the devil's advocates. They are they who cannot express a different point of view without accusing the person who may differ from them of being evil somehow. So, 
notice how, how easy it is to do it the right way. If the Spirit of the Lord is working in you and you hear somebody say something you know is wrong. I did this today. And a sweet girl came up to me and said, Brother Skousen, I don't think you finished your story. And I said, which one? She said, the one that talked about my country. You left a very bad impression of my country. I said, I really did. I didn't finish my story. And I repent. And she said, I... Now, now you see, she came up and suggested to me I didn't finish my story. Th that made it so easy. It didn't put me on the... Uh, she didn't come up and say, uh, you were, you're biased, you're prejudiced, uh, etc. Which she could have done. She just came up in a very sweet way and said, Brother Scott, I don't think you finished your story. And, and what you did say, I think, left a wrong impression of my, my country. And as I thought about it, I was trying to make a point, and I made the point, but in the process, I left the wrong impression of her country. And at the 11 o'clock class on Thursday, I will apologize to the class. That was so sweet the way she brought that to my attention. She could have been terribly offended, but she knew that I did not do it in a malicious spirit, and therefore she came back to talk to me in that kind of a sweet spirit of a peacemaker. Now, that's what you do when you hear somebody say something you know is wrong is to say to yourself, now how can I bring that to his attention so he won't misunderstand? And work out a way. And usually you can say, now, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, if, if we take that now as a fact, as you've just told us now, how, how would we deal with that passage in the 76th section which says thus and thus and thus and thus? What would, you, how, what would your feeling be in dealing with that passage? And very often you'll hear the person say, well, say it again. I'm not sure I've, I've remembered that passage before. So you repeat it. And the person is able to say, well, let me think about that one. I, that, that does seem to make a difference, doesn't it? I'll think about that this afternoon. We'll discuss that more next time. Now, you see, he hasn't lost face. He's just a fellow student. That's the way you can do it. I've watched the Quorum of the Twelve start out at 180 degrees opposite and let the Spirit of the Lord bring them into gravitation where the Lord wants them where that wonderful spirit of confirmation can come. And I watch those brethren, how they've disciplined themselves. One says, now this I think we should do. This one says, he has to say that he feels that definitely won't work. It is an error, uh, both of judgment and experience. Now, how do you say that? And it's marvelous how they say it. As they say, well, now, I, I wonder if there is another possibility. They'll start out sort of like that. I wondered if it wouldn't work maybe equally well and maybe even better if we tried thus and so. Which would be the better of those two? And they toss it out that way. Nobody pretending to be the ultimate word because none are until the confirming spirit of the Lord comes on that quorum. And the second they get that, everybody unites and says, that's it. And they go forward no matter how which side they've been on. I watched that happen. It's thrilling to see how they wait on the Lord and get the confirming spirit for a decision. Sometimes it takes several meetings before they'll get the confirming spirit. They just keep working at it. Well, this is peacemaking. And in your family, with your roommates, see if you can be a peacemaker. There's a, it's so easy to get to, to heckle. I watched John Prince do that on television. He's a professional at it. Right? He was on television last night. He heckles his guests. He's cute. He's clever. He's a clown. A clown always attracts a crowd. But nobody learns anything because he absolutely frustrates his guests who come to try and say what they have on their minds. He's also on KSXX. You never learn anything on that program. You may get a few giggles and laughs out of the silly, stupid things that happen. But he's a professional heckler. And sometimes somebody needs to remind him that he brings his guests there under um, false pretenses. He asks them to come and respond to questions which will be asked. They are never given a chance to respond. So no, no intelligent answers are given because he will interrupt uh, in three seconds, five seconds, seven seconds. I counted them one night just to watch. A, a, a complete uh, dissension spreader. And he attacks President Lee at regular intervals, attacks the state, attacks the culture. He's only about 32 or 3, I imagine, uh, millionaire already made his money off this state and constantly attacking it. Does it with this dissension, spirit of dissension. So it's a strange spirit. Um, then finally you reach that, that stage where the Holy Ghost has been able to, to 
sort of galvanize you ready for persecution. Now you see, you haven't felt that. Uh, you won't know what it's like to stand there with a companion who's a great uh, grandson of, of John Taylor and suddenly have a mass of people swarm up to you with canes and clubs and yelling, yelling, kill him, kill them, kill them. It happened twice to me in, in Ipswich. We had to be rescued by the police both times. And uh, I was 18 at the time. I'm not used to having people rush at me and say they're going to kill me. And I want to tell you that did something to me. And so we were put in a police van and we were rushed off. They went on down to our little humble chapel, went inside, wrecked all the furniture and so forth. They'd done that several times. Um, that's a strange, terrible feeling. As you see, human passion and emotion all of a sudden turned loose on you. It's one thing to watch it on TV or to see mobs marching in the street burning down Safeway stores or uh, Bank of America branches, etc. But when it's your house and you, I'll tell you, it's not entertainment anymore. Now that's the final stage where God says, I can now put you to the test and you could have your house burned down, lose your job, be reviled, and be able to take it. That's what the saints did. But every time persecution hits, do you know what happens? Divides the church right in two. Right in two. And we have some people who immediately try to disengage and have the, the, the strong Mormons, the ones that are holding the line, appear to be overzealous or something. And they will immediately try to accommodate to the enemy and do whatever equivocating they have to do in order to achieve it. Divides the church right in two. Now the prophecies would rather suggest that that's up front somewhere. So we're trying to go through the beatitude, refinement, and strengthening so we can each hold. And none of us know till we've gotten it whether we'll take the test. You really don't know. Someone asked Mr. Hoover one time, what would you have done if you'd been in Sam Cowley's place when he was facing John Dillinger? He said, I have no idea. I have no idea at all. He said, until you're there, you won't know. And this is true. I found this in critical situations. Some people that were a little nervous, people that you never would have thought uh, would have held up under tension and pressure, just as calm and high precision, careful, methodical. And I've had some uh, big, well-contained uh, uh, supermen, you know, just go all to pieces, scared and amazing how people react when the test comes. So, these are the things that prepare you for the test. Now, after he had given the Beatitudes, aren't they beautiful, really? That is the key of the restored gospel on the Beatitudes, which you can share with anybody else, and you're going to need the Beatitudes, believe me, in your life. Read them often. Remember what they mean. And when I ask you about what it means when it says, blessed are they that mourn, it's talking about those that mourn and are willing to come into Christ and follow his pattern so they can be comforted. And uh, when I ask you what it means to, uh, uh, what he's saying when he talks about the poor in spirit, he's talking about those that are discouraged and hardly wonder whether it's worth living, who are willing to come into Christ and work it out. The Beatitudes are really beautiful, as their name implies. Now he goes on to say, Ye are the salt of the earth, are there any chemists among us? Any who have taken chemistry? Let me see your hands. You chemists, let me ask you a question. Can salt lose its savor? Can salt lose its savor? As long as you've got salt, you've got salt. And wherever you've got salt, it has savor. That's the correct answer. Salt cannot lose its savor. But that's our salt. That's Morton's. <laughs> that's pure salt. They didn't have pure salt in those days. What they would do would be to find a salt lick, a salt lick, where you have salt mixed in with the soil. And they would scoop up the salt-laden the salt soil. And that's what they had. Now, if that soil is, is wet, the salt, of course, can be dissolved away, can it? And all of a sudden, the soil that they've been using to sprinkle into the soup it doesn't have any salty flavor anymore. It loses, it actually loses its savor. And they used to call that salt. They called the combination of material salt. And so it would lose its savor in very damp weather and so forth. It could lose its savor. 
and then they just have to throw it out. It was good for nothing. It's just dirt. That's all that was left. They didn't have any salt mines. They just had salt licks. So will you kind of remember what that means? Not salt lake, but salt licks. All right, then he said light. And this is my last point. Ye must be the light unto the world. To be the light unto the world, you must not put your light under a bushel. Therefore the brethren said, we don't want any more students coming to BYU. We have enough students at BYU now to put a light up on the hill so that the world can see what we're trying to do with our youth, where we can get 85% of them through uh, without moral casualties, without drugs, etc. We have about a 15% turnover that have problems. But uh, and that's only a, a, a guess because nobody knows exactly. But little studies that have been shown would suggest that we're making it about 85%. Nobody does it like that as a rule. In quantity, the way we're doing it. But no more. Keep them down at Pasadena College, UCLA, Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard. Why? Why? To be a light. Set an example. Spread the gospel. And hopefully not become contaminated in the process. But we have some casualties here who become contaminated. There's no guarantee when you come to BYU that one comes through unscathed because we've always had a certain percentage that go braying off into the wilderness. But in any event, be a light unto the world, he said. And uh, this is not preaching. What is it? What kind of a light is this? <coughs> that men may see what? See your good works. And say, now that's really something. I remember on one occasion, I was offered a drink at a convention while I was with the FBI. And uh, the fellow said, I'm going to insist that you just try this. I don't think you've ever tried a good scotch um, on the rocks. And I, I want you to just drink this. And so he, he, re he just insisted and he handed it to me. I took it and I said, now look, this is something that I just don't do. I love a good 7-Up, and if you've got that, I'll take it. But you wouldn't want me to drink that, would you? And I handed it back to him, and somebody handed me a 7-Up, and the fellow says, Boy, I thought you were going to let us down. <laughs> well, see, you just, you, you just never know. They, they take pride. They actually take pride. Here they are drinking a scotch and so proud of the fact you're not. You have no idea how they are grateful that, they're, that somebody stands for something. And that's such a little thing, a scotch. Such a little thing. All right, now, next time I think I can catch up for you, but I wanted you to be sure to know what the church now knows about the Beatitudes that isn't taught anywhere else that I know of.